We'll tell you how Lexington leaders plan to fix and replace traffic signals throughout the city. Frankfurt police are searching for a driver who crashed into a man this morning and then left him lying in the middle of a road. He's seen six Triple Crown winners in his lifetime. Now he's getting the chance of a lifetime. What a 98-year-old equine vet says about getting to meet American Pharaoh. Tracking, alerting, protecting. This is WKYT News at 530. Good afternoon. They say that dozens of traffic signals need to be replaced in Lexington. Next week, the Division of Traffic Engineering will unveil a plan to improve traffic lights in the city. They say more than 40 signals are worn out. Sam Smith takes a look at the city's plan to replace the lights in our top story at 530. Drivers may only notice a deteriorating traffic signal when it's flashing instead of its normal cycle. But if you look inside, you can see wires that are frayed and animals that have turned the equipment into their home. So we've got some, some signal infrastructure from the 70s, maybe even from before. Director Dow Haskins Squire says 40 signals in town need to be replaced. They can only get to six of them this year, though, so they'll have to prioritize. Minor fixes will be made while the replacement work is going on. Now, beyond all the repairs and rebuilds, the Division of Traffic Engineering also wants to bring something new to drivers in Lexington. If you want to see what traffic looks like on Man of War or on Nicholasville Road, you can do that in advance of leaving your house. That'll be possible when these traffic cameras are available online. New handicapped accessible ramps and new crosswalks will also be installed as part of the plan. I think we've got, um, we've got some issues with pedestrian safety. We've got a number over 100 ped vehicle collisions that happened in Fayette County last year. Funding for all of these efforts is in the mayor's proposed budget. Once it gets approved, work can begin. In Lexington, Sam Smith, WKYT. The planned signal work is expected to take a year to finish. It is. It is the third hit and run crash in as many weeks in central Kentucky. And tonight, police are looking for the driver who hit a walker in Frankfurt. It happened on Wilkinson Boulevard. Police tell us a person passing by found the man lying unconscious in the middle of the road about 4.30 this morning. Mark Barber is talking to police who have a message for pedestrians. The debris that was scattered across Wilkinson Boulevard here in Frankfurt has now been cleared. But police say they are still searching for the driver who hit a man and then drove off, leaving him lying in the road. Investigators say someone who was driving on Wilkinson Boulevard near Fair Oaks Lane noticed a body in the road around 4.20 this morning. Officers tell us when they got here, they found a man who had been hit by a car. We're told he doesn't have life-threatening injuries, but he does have several broken bones. Police say the driver who crashed into the man while he was walking in the road didn't stop. It's at least the third case in central Kentucky in three weeks where a driver ran after hitting someone on the side of the road. Last week, 20-year-old David Bell was killed after he was hit by a car while he was walking along a road in Scott County. Two weeks before that, a bicyclist, Mark Hinkle, was killed in Scott County when a car crashed into him. Officers say the hit and run cases are a sad reminder that pedestrians can't trust drivers to follow the rules of the road. Try and uh, wear bright colored clothing or reflective clothing if possible. If you're out at night, carry a flashlight if you can. Police say if the driver who hit the man this morning is caught, they would need to interview them before deciding what charges they would face. I'm told at the very least, they would be charged with leaving the scene of an accident. In Frankfurt, Mark Barber, WKYT. Now, police say they have not been able to find any witnesses yet, so they do not have a description of the vehicle that crashed into that man. Well, it is a steamy day in the bluegrass. It is, and we're tracking some scattered storms and showers as we head into our weekend. Chief Meteorologist Chris Bailey's doing all the hard work over there with that, Chris. <laughs> a lot of folks who are outside really doing the hard work today, Sam and Jennifer. We've got the sweat factor that is off the charts. Of course, you've been outside today. Yeah, you probably know what I'm talking about, right? Look at temperatures 88 Lexington, just down the road, 77 Richmond, 77 Danville, where we've had some raindrops. Overall, it's been a cooler day. Today just didn't feel cooler because humidity 
was on the increase today compared to yesterday. Live first alert defenders scattered. Showers and thunderstorms continuing to crank up across parts of the area. Some locally heavy rains here showing up Lake Cumberland into the Russell Springs area up into southern parts of Casey County as well. Little shower and thunderstorm action north of McKee into northern Jackson County. Folks around Irvin looking to our south getting out on uh, at least some darkening skies. Beattyville, a little thunder and lightning heading your way. We've had showers and storms lining up from West Liberty back toward parts of Powell County. One of our weather watchers down here, Timothy Bruno from the Powell County area, showing one of those showers from way up on top of a mountain there in the distance. Uh, again, some locally heavy downpours. Lexington Metro, hey, we continue to be left out. Those some spotty action showing up across parts of northern Kentucky. Anything that's out there is going to continue to rumble its way through over the next few hours as thermometers drop from the upper 80s to the upper 70s. I'll come back in just a few minutes, guys, and we'll track additional rounds of showers and thunderstorms as the tropical fill is here to stay. An eastern Kentucky county no longer has a judge executive after an appeals court threw out the results of last November's election. Our county by county coverage at 5:30 begins in McGoffin County. The court ruled they don't know who won the McGoffin judge executive race and declared the office vacant. If the court's decision stands, there will likely be a special election in November, and Governor Bashir could appoint someone in the meantime. The incumbent Charles Harden beat John Montgomery by 28 votes. Montgomery sued, accusing Hardin of bribes and buying votes. In Boyd County, police say they found thousands of dollars worth of marijuana in a home. Ashland police say they showed up to the house after spotting a vehicle they thought was connected to a burglary. When police went inside, they say they found more than 150 marijuana plants with a street value of more than $300,000. Police say there was also a teenager at the home. 36-year-old Kelly Collins was arrested for an unrelated warrant. In Anderson County, the community will come together this weekend to help a police officer who has spent nearly 30 years helping others. Lawrenceburg police officer Kenny Goodlett was first diagnosed with pneumonia, then found out he had several tumors throughout his body. Goodlett is now in hospice care. There's a benefit tomorrow night starting at 6 at 1999 Harrodsburg Road in Lawrenceburg and will feature a pig roast and live music. Hundreds of state workers across Kentucky will soon see a bigger paycheck soon. Today, Governor Bashir spoke at the Eastern Kentucky Veterans Center to discuss the new minimum wage hike. He says veterans are the most vulnerable population, and those taking care of the veterans cannot be vulnerable themselves. Now, while most of the population will not see a raise, the governor says this is a step in the right direction. You know, nobody can live on $7.25 an hour anymore. It's just, it's crazy for anybody to even think they can. And while we can't get it done statewide yet, we, we keep trying to pass it in our General Assembly, we're at least going to make sure that every state worker makes a living wage in the future. On Monday, the governor raised the minimum wage to 10 10 an hour for state workers. This affects nearly 800 Kentuckians in the executive branch. It's a big weekend at Churchill Downs. American Pharoah is back at the track, fresh off capturing the Belmont and the Triple Crown. Today, a man who's witnessed the last six Triple Crown winners got an up close look at the horse who's raced his way into thoroughbred history. Steve Bergen has details on their meeting. Uh, You've spoiled them. Triple Crown winning trainer Bob Baffert led three year old American Pharoah to 98 year old William McGee. And the two seemed to hit it off from the start, especially when McGee offered a few carrots to solidify their newfound friendship. He is the oldest living equine veterinarian who made Kentucky his home decades ago. Doc McGee has seen some of the best. Well, I'm convinced he's a, an exceptional individual. He's set apart, I think, from even the champions. And he should know it was 1946 when he saw Assault capture the Triple Crown. It's the most decisive triumph since Whirl Away as Assault pounds home by eight lengths. The win, the Kentucky... Then came Citation, Secretariat, Seattle Slew, Affirmed, and last Saturday, American Pharaoh. As for making comparisons... I'd hate to pick a, a winner out of the bunch, but... This one comes right, right up with the, the foremost. Doc McGee says American Pharaoh has the temperament, ability, and durability, everything you look for in a winner. Oh my God! I never saw a horse that would 
understand as much loving as he does. And, uh, and besides that, he's got a, a top of the mind trainers, too. The Triple Crown celebration continues tomorrow night at Churchill Downs. American Pharaoh will be paraded on the track, and the engraved Kentucky Derby trophies will also be presented. All it took was the promise of easy money for a con man to lure neighbors and friends into a bank fraud scheme. As you'll hear, the accomplices viewed it as no big deal, but it turned out to be a serious federal crime. He had a serious cocaine problem at the time, and that's why he initially started. It helped him find his cocaine habit. He is Brian Willingham, the ringleader of a fraud scheme that cost banks more than $200,000. Willingham pulled off the scam by luring in neighbors. Different residents at this housing complex, they use their own information to open up accounts through this bank, knowing that the only thing they were going to do was receive the checks in the mail and write worthless checks on all the accounts. Here's how it worked. Willingham used his neighbors to set up bank and credit card accounts. Once accounts were active, Willingham would deposit phony checks. And just went the very next day and withdrew as much of it as they could before the bank realized that the checks were worthless. Willingham recruited more than 100 people, all promised they would receive a small percentage of the money stolen. I think that they just thought that they were going to have bad credit. That's the worst that they thought they could happen. They didn't even really see it as stealing. You ultimately helped steal $200,000 from this bank. Willingham even recruited family members, including his uncle and cousins who lived nearby. But he made one move that was viewed as out of line. They realized that someone used his deceased grandmother's information to open an account, and that was the one time I saw anybody show any uh, understanding that, well, now, hey, that's wrong. Some advice from postal inspectors, never give your personal information to anyone, especially someone offering you money in return. If you are approached with someone who tells you that Oh, this is a quick, easy way to make money. You can't really get into trouble. No one's going to get hurt. It'll just hurt your credit, To Absolutely no. When you know that money does not belong to you, you could end up federally indicted. And as for Brian Willingham, he was convicted of bank fraud and sentenced to five years in prison. Follow WKYT online at WKYT.com. Join the conversation on Twitter and become a part of the WKYT Facebook family. Dozens of students are spending their summer helping make their city beautiful. They're painting a mural at Riverview Park in Frankfurt. And their canvas is the flood wall behind the Ward Oates Amphitheater. Photojournalist Dean Handy tagged along with the group to get a look at their work. This looks great. I think it is um, fun to do. Uh, this is the Kentucky River Children's Mural that we're doing as summer art camps. I love art. Yeah. And we're right here next to the Kentucky River and the Ward Oates Amphitheater, so this is going to create a nice backdrop to break up the battleship gray that was previously under all this. I think it's neat to be able to do it and then everyone sees it. Early. Do you want me to hold it? Coming on the inside. Sure, you can hold it. Okay, okay. The, um... the sense of community these kids are going to learn off working with one another. They're going to make new friends. Some of them have met for the first time in camp here. and. So with any camp, whether it's your church camp or your art camp or whatever you do, it, it's nice to have that. It's just like memories have been going by. You get to see all your memories on the wall. She's doing a really good job. Look there. Hold on, read it. We've had more than a few people come down here to just to look at the mural, and they step foot in here and they go, I didn't even know this was here. So this is raising awareness for not just the mural and the wall, but for this beautiful amphitheater. That, and, you know, this trail goes all the way down to Buffalo Trace. Okay. Yeah. I like the bubbles, though. Bubbles. I like that color. This wall is 19 panels long, 21 feet each panel, so it's over 400 feet. And this is what the result of teamwork is. This is what the result of everybody's different way they paint, of all your different preferences of what you want, what size brush or color, and it took all of us to do this. You have grass on your leg? On the wall, right? You painted my finger. <laughs> You say when you come back like 20 years from now, I painted this. Yeah, painted this. 
Beautiful job, students. Uh, by the way, again, this is being done on the flood wall behind the Ward Oats Amphitheater. The students are part of an uh, artist camp. If you want to donate to their cause to help the kids with their project, a GoFundMe page has been set up.